Everyone, and I mean everyone, has an opinion about fake news. We wanted an expert to talk about this today. Our next speaker is just such an expert. Uh, Edward Wasserman is Dean of the Graduate School of Journalism at the University of California at Berkeley. He holds a BA from Yale cum laude and a license in philosophy from the Sorbonne, University of Paris, and a PhD from the London School of Economics. His career in journalism began in 1972, and among his various roles include CEO and editor-in-chief of the Daily Business Review chain, executive business director of the Miami Herald, city editor of the Casper Wyoming Star Tribune, and edit editorial director of Primedia's Media Central Division. That's 140 publication Prior to coming to Berkeley in 2013, he was the Knight Foundation Professor of Journalism Ethics at Washington and Lee University for a decade. He's been on the executive board for the Association for Practical and Professional Ethics and the editorial advisory board for the Journal of Media Ethics. His academic specialties include plagiarism, source relations, confidentiality, and conflict of interest. I cannot think of a more timely topic or a more expert speaker to cover this. Please give a warm welcome to Ed Wasserman. Well, thank you very much, Jay. Uh, let me just say that when, uh, I, when I was assured there'd be a packed house on a sunny Sunday morning in Berkeley in June, I will confess I was skeptical. <laughs> I, I'm not going to be able to stay uh, for the rest of the program. My wife and I are looking for homes in Berkeley, Kensington. Another exercise in strange credulity. <laughs> so I feel very much, uh, very much at home here, and and I'm very happy to have this uh, be able to address this topic. Um, you know, once upon a time when we in the media imagined a utopia back in the 60s and 70s, and fresh out of Marshall McLuhan, and we said that if somebody had told us there would be a time when all of us would have handheld devices that would give us access to more information than the best source of important on Earth would access 20 years ago, and would give us the ability to reach far greater audiences than the most highly circulating newspaper in the world to reach 20, 30 years ago, we would have said, sounds like utopia. This is it. This democratization of discourse is going to enable and usher in a kind of political culture and social possibilities that have been denied us thanks to the monopolization of news, monopolization of information, the way it systematically tilted to benefit established world. Um, and now, of course, you know, I need hardly tell you a good deal of chagrin uh, to learn that all this sunny democratization has come uh, with an ever more aggressive spread of false beliefs, a deepening harm to political culture, now riven by adherence to incompatible cultural cosmologies built on off of only fallacious truth claims. So fake news has become the newest big thing in media talk. Um, it is, uh, and I, I can't, I probably, this is the fourth or fifth opportunity I've had with the panels and whatnot to talk about fake news. It has caught fire. Uh, as a matter of public concern, and as an applause line for politicians looking for a stick with which to hit back over unfavorable coverage. Um, it's worth considering fakery in itself as well as why it had become such a powerful and influential cultural theme, or meme, or trope, or whatever the current phrasing is. Um, and I think the reason fake news, which I'm going, to, I'm going to refer to fake news as deliberate fabrication, just to confine our discussion. Uh, but I want to take the question of fakery and artifice in the news in a, in a broader, look at it in a broader light. Um, so, because I think the reason fake news has gotten so much traction is because it has become a catch-all for features of news as it has always been practiced. 
that actually do warrant disbelief and mistrust. I'm going to suggest a different context within which you consider this phenomenon, one that goes beyond the problem of hoaxes and foregrounds elements of artifice. Maybe I should use the word construction or contrivance. Um, instead, that have always been integral to the practice of news. Uh, and, and actually, in a paradoxical way, probably enable the media to conduct whatever truth-seeking news and journalism are able to carry out. So the paradox is some of the things I'm going to criticize are probably unavoidable parts of the normal practice of news gathering. Um, and, and, to put, and I want to put all of this in the context of a media system that is built increasingly on trickery and deceit. So before I talk about news practices that, that, that raise concerns, let me point out the problematic features of the digital media ecosystem within which news is now embedded. I assume we are all aware of the fact that news as conventionally distributed is, is uh, just an artifact. It is something that's a vestige of systems that are basically obsolescent and disappearing. I'm talking about newspapers, I'm talking about broadcast television. These things are yesterday's news of getting expression. <laughs> so this system now I want to point out is a vast, it's a vast system. Its economics are built on thoroughgoing, dissembling, and artifice. It's an emporium of storefronts inviting people to turnstiles so they can be noted and sold to and manipulated. But I'm not just talking about phishing, I'm not talking about deceptive solicitations, uh, concealment, hacking, etc. I'm talking about when the ecosystem, right, when the, 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 the digital economy functions as intended, not when aberrant criminals get, get involved. Um, and a huge proportion of internet traffic is to some degree not what it purports to be. The dominant economic underpinnings of the ad-supported digital world are based on thinly disclosed surveillance intended to nourish speculation as the behavior and responses of participating, but largely unwitting, consumers. Who you are, what you like, increasingly where you are, and where you're going, this is the information that's being systematically harvested as part of the way the internet pays for everything else that's on there. So the microeconomics of the internet is really an informational trade. You pay for information with information, which you're being furtively induced to provide or to allow others to gather about yourself. Content is the lure. Content is the bait. The payment is the payment for that information. The uses of that information, the information about you, the uses to which that information will be put not well disclosed or well understood by consumers. Just how much you're paying, therefore, isn't really disclosed either. So when we talk about news, we must acknowledge this larger universe of dissembly that digital technology has enabled, and which news, no matter how honestly gathered and presented, serves and is served by. It's amazing to me that journalism, which, and, and journalism ethics, which places an enormous amount of importance and frets and sweats over the questions how it's okay to gather information and how it's not okay to gather information. What are the rights of sources? What kind of disclosure do you have to make to sources to ensure that they understand whom they're talking about and the use of the information is going to be put? This is a big deal when we teach and we train journalists. We take that very seriously. And yet, we embed the entire industry of journalism in an economy that, that pillages information willy-nilly with no regard at all for consent, no regard at all for getting people to actually understand the uses to which the information is being taken from them and about them is going to be put. So you have this ironic ethical divide between the business side of journalism now and the professional side of journalism that the reporter and source engage in. Now, the media coverage of fake news has tended to isolate made-up stories as what most concerns the public. The media often misunderstand the things the public hate about them. Um, they will insist that inaccuracy, uh, for example, is a tremendous concern among the public, and so they run corrections. 
typically, if you give her, if you're a connoisseur of corrections, corrections never correct anything of the moment, anything consequential. When it comes time for the New York Times to correct the fact they got the Iraq War wrong, <laughs> they read about 10 paragraphs on an inside page. Right? As compared with three open pages devoted to Jason Blair, whose inconsequential fabrications embarrassed the paper in professional. And they devoted four or five reporters, gave them weeks to, to, to document each and every one of these completely. I, I, I'm not saying Jason Blair didn't deserve to, to be exposed, but uh, where's the balance? Where's the proportionality? Um, but the media would believe that inaccuracies are something that really bothers the public, and so they correct the middle initial, somebody's name, read the New York Times, corrections, it's, it's a laugh. And they, because they rarely actually say, oh, you know, remember that story you ran last year about XYZ? Turns out it kind of wasn't true. You don't have to see that. Right? And, or they'll insist that uh, uh, source confidentiality is something they need to police. Because giving, it, somehow they believe that the public cares a lot if uh, too many unnamed sources are being used. My own belief is that the public cares if the information is wrong, not what the source is being identified. Um, but here, the, the, the media have, if, had focused on uh, deliberate fabrication. But my own sense is that people have long been uneasy about fundamental elements of news beyond veracity. When politicians cry fake news, this is often what they mean. They don't mean that the news is inaccurate or not, it doesn't have some veracity to it. They're kind of wondering, well, what is this? Why are you continuing to fuss over possible contacts between my campaign and Russians, right, when you haven't established the fact that that was consequential and had an impact on these campaigns. They'll say, well, you are deliberately, so they're looking at, in that case, standards of significance. Now, this is something that I think is very much of concern. When people complain about the news, they want to know, why is that news? Why is this news work? And what is that, and, and when they talk about the bias of the news, that's the kind of thing they sing about. Not as biased because you're suppressing facts, you're biased because you've decided that this has a consequence at a, at a moment and an importance that I don't see. So what is news and why? What is newsworthiness? Who decides what matters? And why is it that a certain newsworthiness makes us a fuss about it? Right? So number one, standards of significance people are concerned about. Uh, the way stories are framed. It's another, another one. The great complaint about election coverage is all about the horse race. It's all about who's there. It's not about what's at stake. It's all about how very policy choices might impact people and direct the country in one way rather than another. Um, policy disputes are automatically, reflexively presented as exercises in advancing and retarding the fortunes of the players. Why are they growing on how Trump is doing with things by coming out of Paris and start telling you to deal with the bad one out Certainly, the overwhelming coverage had to do with political consequences decision to pull out of Paris Force, not whether it actually is going to matter. All right, so, that's, so the way stories are framed. The third thing, what is considered adequate from an evidentiary standpoint? Right? When NPR sends reporters to the heartland and talks to three people in the small town of Missouri and reports that it's got its finger on the pulse, you go, uh, what? <clears throat> you know that they have already pre-decided the selection of opinion and the range of opinion that will be reflected in this report. And so if you file the report and say, well, you didn't get anybody to say this, go find me somebody to say this. So the whole evidentiary exercise, the idea that you're empirically valid, you're conducting something that's empirically valid, is bogus. It's, it's, you're looking for a certain kind of story, you find people. I get calls from reporters all the time. I'm doing this on XYZ. I need somebody to say this. It's a corrupt, it's a corrupt enterprise. Okay. I'll play the game. You know, I'm quoted in the New York Times. Suddenly, I'm an expert. Right. So there's this kind of corruption in source relations that's extremely, I think, extremely hard. So, but what is considered adequate from the evidentiary standpoint is something that bothers people. And when they say fake news, oftentimes that's what they're looking at. They're not so stupid as to think that people are making up stories of all wrong. Um, and what are the deals being cut to get this story? What's not being told? What are the stories the reporters who are too close to sources know about that cannot write? So 
but there's this larger, and I think there's always been a larger unease about media as manipulative and self-serving rather than the adversarial warriors these people imagine. So I'm saying that some of these concerns derive from standard practices in the traditional production of normal news. And we hear, we hear echoes of that in the cries about fake news. It's not that all news is fake news. It's that the moral and epistemic claim that news people make, that they are producing accounts of reality that are uniquely fair, balanced, insightful, trustworthy, and therefore merit the culture and legal privileges our society affords, hard to sustain. News is a particular form of social knowledge. It's gathered to be sold and sold against for profit as a market commodity. Part of its marketplace appeal, to be sure, relates to its central role in civic discourse. But commercial pressures on the revenue and the cost sides have had formative influences on the evolution of this particular form of social awareness and on its limitations as a truth-telling device. The simple-minded notion that news, even when conducted scrupulously and executed honestly, is normally a faithful reflection of reality isn't one that would stand scrutiny. It doesn't make news without enormous value. We need it to keep up with changing circumstances. We need to share with others concerned with realities that are interesting and at times emblematic. And as a social ritual, it rivets and binds us together. But it has its own inbuilt biases and introduces distortions hence my use of the word artifice to describe normal news. Now what are the bias, some of the biases? Well first of all, it systematically privileges change, right? Not enduring reality. Calls attention to what's given. Right? That's what's new. Man bites dog, right? Well, men don't normally bite dog, so that's news, right? I spent many years as an assigning editor, you pick up a nap, what is news? That's news, go at it, right? Um, and it also gives news organizations a good reason to tell people they've got to keep up on the news because it's different today than it was yesterday. So because of sales point and the periodical publishing, the, the, the focus on, on fact-based fact reporting grew with the, the uh, advent of periodical, um, <coughs> periodical publishing. Opinions don't change. That's true. So you have a you privileging change at, at, at the expense of enduring reality. It's off at that point. Well, who's reporting, you know, poverty? Well, it doesn't change that. Yeah, still the poor people to be with us, et cetera, et cetera. So it's not newsworthy as such. It generally requires going outside the forms that news normally traffics in and doing the long series, the decades of newspapers, doing long stories that nobody's going to read. And, you know, it, it, it's a longer, more discursive forms of narrative arose to do those in jury realities. These are not news. So privileging change is one bias in the news. It looks for aberrations from the norm, said, um, and it, as a result, you end up with creating widespread misperceptions of underlying realities. The best example is people routinely believe there's more crime than there is. Why? Because it gets covered. You know, you're not going to cover all the people who went to work and didn't get mugged. Um, <laughs> The dominance of story forms. We, we tell our report, oh, you know, this is telling stories. That's a very, very pernicious concept. But stories have a form to them. They have rising action. They have heroes and villains. They have climax, the denouement. They have all kinds of things you associate with fiction. Oh, what happens, you know, what happens with facts getting away? Facts that can be very gnarly. There are material facts that we would agree are germane to the story. Don't fit anywhere. Right? So that can become a very that can become a way to sell and a way to induce people to take an interest in experiences and realities that they have themselves don't have firsthand knowledge of. That's the good part. The bad part is it comes at the expense of a certain pruning, a certain polishing and sanding that can remove some of the subtlety and complexity of realities that you're trying to get people to understand. So story forms are a problem. News organizations are built around beats. Beats are something you have been reported. Beats are typically built on coverage of institutions. So beats tend to privilege institutions and give them a consistent newsworthiness in the news flow. It also builds up huge problems of, of codependency between word and sources, where deals are cut. 
fact, it's absurd. If you think about it, it's absurd to think that somebody is going to be relentlessly adversarial towards sources on whom this person is keenly reliant for professional advancement and success. Right? You're trying to get information from people, develop relations of trust at what cost. So the beat system, but also, in, in my point was that privileges institutions, uh, you know, formulaic, you draw pseudo events, being phrased by Daniel Borson a half century ago. These are things that happened in order to be recorded that had no inherent significance. Bill signing, ribbon cutting, and the like. So great. Uh, one of uh, Reagan's uh, press secretaries, Larry Speaks, had a great sign over his desk that said, "Don't tell us how to." Uh, Oh, don't tell us how to stage the news and we won't tell you how to report it. <laughs> and then we have the tradition of objectivity, quote unquote. This is a scientific audience. I wouldn't dare suggest that objectivity has anything to do with what reporters do, but it's an aspirational doctrine uh, that, that enshrines, in fact, a, a, a deference to authority. Because that's usually where you go to find the objective, the Olympian detached view of what's going on. You may report the consequences of a flood, but the people who are washed out of their homes, right, that tends to be an anecdotal lead to the story. The actual gist of the story is going to come from somebody sitting at a desk with a telephone in an official office, give you the real, the big picture. Right? Interesting, the reporter would do that. Certainly the poet, the novelist, would, would, would locate the reality of the flood in the people who's home. Um, so, uh, and I think the other element I would point out about this is calibrating to maximize effectiveness as an ad conduit, looking to maximize audience size, demographic appeal. Uh, in the digital age, uh, I would add, there's a growing dominance of visuals in the news, and news organizations are now, regardless of whether NPR, you know, whether they started out as an audio uh, channel or started out as a print channel, the New York Times, or even the Wall Street Journal. Imagine now there's a photo editor in the Wall Street Journal. Visuals dominate. Visuals now dominate, and stories that lend themselves to visuals will tend to get disproportionate coverage. Or, and, or prominence. Once the story has the visuals to give it legs, it's going to have greater prominence. And sometimes the visuals themselves are what drives the prominence and is it's thought to give it. And in that respect, it drives the judgment as the significance of the story. Um, and I think I'll add a couple more things. The news cycle, extremely important to bear in mind, the incredible acceleration, the velocity of the news cycle now. The need now to respond to events as quickly as possible. Even legacy established news organizations are not prepared to allow news to be breaking on Facebook or Twitter and not have a response. And they have basically decided for market purposes that their privacy requires them to be responding to that. Now, that's great. Except, what about when you don't have the facts? That's a problem. That was a problem with the Boston Marathon bombing. We came very close to having lynch mobs going out to find people who were wrongly identified as being responsible for that bombing, were named, their pictures are out there. There was a poor guy who turned out as a student in New Jersey. Are you dead? He committed suicide a week before this. He was identified as being one of the bombers. It caused tremendous sorrow because he was missing at that point. There's a myth that one of the changes in ethical doctrine has been this idea that transparency suffices. As long as you tell people how you know what you think you know, it's okay to put it out there even if it's false. Because you can then fix it. The myth of the self cleansing internet. <coughs> you run an error, you go back, you say, oh, this is an error, here's the truth. And you, okay, game over. Sin expunged. Right? And of course, anybody who spends a few minutes looking at the, the cognitive psychology, you find out that it's almost completely fallacious. The reality is that corrections oftentimes never catch up with the errors. People don't believe the corrections. In fact, there was one study out of, I think, Chapel Hill, it could have been Duke, that indicated that people believe the error more after they saw the correction. So the bottom line for the journalists is, you've got to get it right. 
internet does not absolve you of a responsibility to confer an information. In fact, in many respects, it makes it even more acute. Um, and now let me just add on top of the rest, the news that you and I understand as being news now competes in an informational ecosystem with unprecedented commercial contamination. We have the rise, you've heard of gated advertising? You've heard of advertorials? Remember back in the day, you'd pick up a newspaper, there'd be a little advertisement, something looks like a news story, right? But it's written by an advertiser, it adopts, it mimics the conventions of news, right? It sounds like a news story, but it's not. It's, it is an informational device that's meant to foreground or somehow insert the suggestion that whatever brand is doing the sponsoring is uh, you know, something we're getting uh, respected. That has now become the, it's now called native advertising. It's meant to deliver this tricked out to look like editorial. Uh, you're finding it throughout, you're finding it throughout the internet. Sometimes it's going to be disclosure is made explicit, and sometimes it is disclosure is concealed. But, so you have this flow of very, very clever, uh, well-trained journalists who are putting out native advertising that is extremely difficult to distinguish from news. So there's a whole kind of larger process of contamination of news flows. So you don't, uh, it, it, so that, it, and, and oftentimes you're seeing stuff whose persuasive intent goes unnoticed because it's engineered to go unnoticed. So, we have this disturbing profile of topical informational flows, contaminated with self-interested content, and, and I think it's much more pernicious than the politically driven fake news. That's the reason for this talk today, and that's got all the attention. I just want that context to be clear. We got a mess up here. Now, this deepens the problem of trustworthiness, which is the most meddlesome problem in news media face. And I'm just add something parenthetically. I think that the there's the adversarialism that the current president has invited and welcomed. I think goads mainstream media into joining a fight that can't help but lead some elements of the public to see the news media as essentially parts and tools. And that too invites a mistrust. I don't know what I'm supposed to tell my students they should do with my president. I, I mean, I, I know that you don't, we, we would all agree you don't just perpetuate, you don't just propagate lies about pointing out that are false. I get that. But somehow when I open up the Washington Post and see eight stories in the front of all of them telling me that this guy is the spawn of Satan, I worry. I worry a little bit. I worry about it, but the other things going on in government that are getting ignored while we focus on this one deranged guy in the White House. It forces an enormous amount of attention. And, and, and the, the possibility of something coming out of the administration. And the, the danger is that we come so far from the editorial imagination of the most intellectual news organizations that we're not even really able to get a, a, a proportionate, I don't want to say balanced view. It, it, it's, it's such a lame word. But I just worry about the press becoming the opposition party. And, and, and that's not their job. They're supposed to cover uh, political political realities and not be the principal party. So I keep that aside. But for purposes of the fake news controversy, I do, I am concerned that the, uh, eventually the, the stature, uh, the credibility, uh, and the trustworthiness of the press suffers to the degree they're forced into a position of basically nonstop adversarialism. And that's what I see happening. Um, and I don't know who's going to cover that. So this is all the contextualized fake news it resides within this informational system, delivers topical updates that have for historical, cultural, political reasons, genuine importance to the function of society. Right? And they have good reason to claim standing as an aid to popular sovereignty, even though the system has huge deficiencies of its own, induced by commercial incentives, by technological opportunities, by a whole host of factors. Um, now, fake news is not new. History of hoaxes, some fabricated for commercial advantage by news organizations uh, themselves. Uh, we've got near news, 
had it for years, we have disinformation, we have stories that have reasonable but not conclusive evidentiary basis that sometimes uh, sometimes have tremendous uh, get tremendous traction. Remember Whitewater? You know how many years the Washington Post chased the Clintons over Whitewater? That's actually what gave rise to the Monica Lewinsky scandal. Will came out of that. You remember the 2004 election? You had two of those stories, dueling stories. You had the, the Swift Boat story that supposedly exposed John Kerry as, I don't know, ally of the Vietcong, I'm not sure what that was. Fraud. And then you had the Bush National Guard, Air National Guard story. And here were two fascinating stories with each of them claiming to have evidentiary basis, right? Um, but both of which had the common impacts discredit media in the eyes of the people who didn't believe what was going on. Here again, authenticity, veracity, media motives were key elements, and the stakes were no less big. So we've, we've been here before. We've been here before with phony, phony news. Um, what's different now? Well, first, the profitability of bogus news has been ratified and sustained by the internet itself. This is a good comment from Evgeny, Evgeny Borisov in The Guardian. Quote, the problem is not fake news, but the speed and ease of its dissemination. It exists primarily because today's digital capitalism makes it extremely profitable for the Google and Facebook to produce and circulate false but click-worthy narratives. Right? So the reason we have a bumper pop of fake news is because we get paid. You get, you draw a crowd, and then you go to Google, and you get on their ad server, and next thing you know, traffic is coming to you, and you can change. The till starts to register money, because Google is giving you money based upon your traffic. The systems, mainly the platforms like Google and Facebook, rewards falsity and calumny far more reliably than the old system. And even though the old system was always like, oh, you're just staying that because you want to sell newspapers. Oh, uh, they'll print anything. So not an unfamiliar criticism of media, but now it's, it's achieved a precision and a calibration that makes it really true. But it used to be really hard, even to run a, to run a salacious story and actually make money from it. You could know that you weren't getting that much of your money from single copy sales, and a lot of your subscribers are going to be angry at you for running stories like that. So the actual trade-off of being a really irresponsible journalist didn't pay that. You're far better off creating a newspaper that had a reputation of credibility and honesty. But nowadays, no. So these the non-apocryphal Macedonian bloggers who confected the stories like Hillary or whatever could be pretty much guaranteed to cash in on the audience numbers. So the first thing, fake news is profitable. Secondly, uh, legacy news media, the trusted news brands, have fallen into the practice of legitimating and weaponizing information of dubious veracity from unrecognized sources. And I think there's no, there's no exaggerating the degree to which this news has gone, leap, leapt over the bounds of the people who are seeing it initially online into the mainstream of news content and that political discourse. Um, now, there are competitive reasons for that. Nobody wants to look out of touch. Established news organizations want to reposition themselves as one-stop news sources. The story is out there, they want to recognize it and report it. Third, the problem of branding. The problem of the internet suppresses branding. So by, and by branding, I mean knowing what the sources of the information and the story you're reading. Um, you would know that if you pick up a copy of the Chronicle, you see it was Chronicle. Back in the day, you knew what the brand was. Now, people tend to say, well, if you ask, well, how, where'd you hear that? Oh, on the internet. <laughs> or, oh, I saw it on Facebook. Same problem. So the actual ultimate source of the information gets is suppressed in the way that people experience and engage with the internet and, and the way that it impacts on them. Um, and branding has always been the most reliable guide to the credibility of news sources. Now, basically been rendered in um,
So, so solutions. These are a little pie in the sky. There is no standard setting anymore. We have reached a low ebb in media regulation in this country. Once upon a time, somebody to have a broadcast license for a puny little UHF TV signal of 50 mile radius would have to satisfy the Federal Communications Commission's licensing requirements and make some kind of effort toward public service. Would be vulnerable to criticisms of, of, of poor practices would have some measure of public accountability. Now we have the mightiest and most influential informational giant in the existing creation of language and they face absolutely no regulatory scrutiny on any level. Now it's possible they may view self-regulation as being in their interest. I don't have a lot of hope for that. The media in this country rejects self-regulation. There is none in the news media either. But I, what I'm saying would require somebody to step up, and perhaps under public pressure, and start to promulgate some standards and practices, even if you don't have enforcement methods. Right now, there's not even moral pressure being put on the, the organization. So that says, so this, what I'm about to say is premised on the idea that somebody's going to take enough of an interest and perhaps have enough clout to, to propagate some standards. So, the first thing is, from the platforms themselves, I, I can't see where else these standards are going to originate. They must relinquish the claim to being a neutral, passive town square. They are publishers, they need to act that way. Which means taking responsibility for what it is that they publish. They're not just conduits. Right? Facebook, says it has launched an aggressive response in collaboration with legacy media. Google says it will take steps to keep its ads off pages that misrepresent, misstate, or conceal information about the publisher, the publisher's content, or the primary purpose of the site. Well, we'll see. The idea that the scale of these enterprises makes that kind of monitoring and scrutiny difficult is loud. They have the computing power. They have capacity to do this. If they could keep child porn off, right? if they could keep Nazi memorabilia off in France and Germany where it's forbidden, they can intervene in ways to make sure that these kinds of people face, that the people that they're carrying face a certain kind of or held a certain standards. Um, I think that they should go further. I mean, we should ask ourselves how comfortable we are allowing these mighty engines to be gatekeepers along these lines. And we need to be mindful that fake news has also been adopted as being brandished by authoritarian governments elsewhere in the world in order to suppress information that they don't like. The fake news has it. You know, be careful what you wish for. Because one person's fake news may be an emancipatory screed in another context. But I think they need to go further. I think they need foregrounding the brands of originating sites and grading them on the links from legitimate news organizations, similar to the functionality that Google originally brought to the search field. They ranked the, the rankings of where you ended up with a Google search depended on who was going to be. Depended on what some sort of reputational uh, evidence that people were finding it to what you were posting reliable, interesting, and worthwhile. I don't see why you could not fashion relatively easily a similar grading mechanism so that when people call out a story on Google, they would know that this has a rating of this based upon the fact that the New York Times ran this story the following day. That's a pretty good sign. That somebody with a brain was looking at this and determining that it was fundamentally, uh, was fundamentally worth sharing. So you could do this. Um, you could insist on site disclosure statements that indicate what news gathering practices and editorial controls they exercise. You want to be, you want to be listed on Google? Fine. Tell us, give us a statement, how much is your staff, where do you get your information, do you have an ethics code, do you run corrections, various things. And this is actually uh, something that Craig Newmark from Mr. Craig's List has been uh, pushing very hard, uh, he's a friend of the J School, and he's a guy who's been very eager to see different standards. It's called the Trust Project, and he's got about uh, 
uh, about 20 or 30 news organizations and universities taking part in promulgating these kinds of rules. Now, whether any of them pay attention to the ratings they come up with is another problem. Um, and the sites themselves need to stop relying on, going back to my earlier point about harvesting and pillaging people's information, it, 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 it's, to me, unconscionable that news sites are able to, and sites on the internet are able to get away with these terms of service statements, rather than telling people the plain English what we're going to do with the information to get about you. I, I just don't know who is allowing this to happen, but this is a fraud, and this is a scam that's got to stop. And the platforms are probably the only place, and by platforms I'm talking about it, Google, uh, Facebook, uh, Twitter, this is the only place where that kind of enforcement can happen. Once you can't get on those platforms, you're dead. You're dead on the internet. That's where the traffic goes. And those are the terms of traffic. Um, I would say there's, there's also a consumer side to this. There's a real absence of consumer, uh, of media literacy on the consumer side. Something we're starting to do with Cal is create a minor in journalism intended for people who don't want to be journalists but want to be able to do many of the things they're trying to do. But giving them proficiencies and skills with which to being in practice journalism, and also the ability to read and digest and, and uh, handle critically the journalism that they encounter. And I'd say a final word uh, on the perils of an ineffectual market. Um, it's hard to resist concluding that the, the apparent freeness of news in the digital world has seeded the clouds for this downpour of crap information. People click on fatuous and ridiculous news because it doesn't cost them anything beyond a few moments. Of course, it may cost them more. We don't really know what that information is being used for. Right? Just that Google and whatnot, they want to provide educational technology starting K through 12 for free. Oh, really? For free? <laughs> How comfortable are you having your kids' academic records accessible for the rest of their lives through the organization that? may be interested in what they want to buy when they get to be 18. But anyway, so this notion, this freeness of the internet is the main problem. Uh, uh, what if there was charge for download? What if you had micro-billing? What if you had a way that you were using the market, the almighty market, right, finding a way that the internet use was uh, And people understood that there was a cost. And people understood, well, do I really want to see that? So that, it, 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 it's an instance right now of market failure because the payment mechanism is like a healthcare system, the payment mechanism is so, is so uh, concealed. Um, so I just can't help but thinking that it might encourage greater discipline and discretion and discernment on the part of the public. So to that degree, the current economics of the internet sustains the market failure and more, act, more fully activated pricing-based choice might go ways toward reducing the demand and therefore the supply of this toxic informational sludge. And that's a, that may come about. There are news organizations now that are looking much harder than they have in the past at starting to charge money. Um, and I think that that's a direction we, you know, it, it's a direction we may have to go in. Because I'm not sure that the current, uh, uh, the current uh, regime of concealment uh, is, is working. And I'm not sure that we're not going to instead see far more what we've seen so far in the last couple of years. So that's what I've got. Uh, I, I could take questions. I don't know what your format is.
this goes on and on. Science published Woo, the, the, the Korean, South Korean, and so on and so on. There, there has to be a, a training of, of reporters to go a little beneath, just not just take uh, the, the title of an authority and then assume that it is true. And somebody has to do it. Really? I was wondering what you uh, what you made of or what what you think of them turning the news into kind of like a sporting type of thing. Um, it seems that commentary or a lot of it is an us versus them kind of format. I mean, even most recently, you know, the Comey hearings, uh, the different news sites were talking about like it was a sporting event, like he struck a blow, or like this makes the White House look bad, or the White House is losing on this, and then of course on the right they were saying this you know vindicated. Uh, Trump, this, you know, save them. Is this, uh, is this, this is something that's new. I mean, as far as I can see, I mean, relatively new. How does that fit into the, the whole fake news thing? Is that, you know, does, does that seem to be changing our thought processes, or is this just falling to the American spirit of competition? Um, it's a good question. I, I, I guess I would not say this is new. You know, those of us who watch the Watergate hearings, it was the arm of the part of the hearings. There, there was, there's something about a hearing format that is so gladiatorial, inherently. And, and it's going to be a face off. It, it falls so irresistibly into that kind of face off and battle. Well, I agree. The question is, is that, the question is not, I, the point is that it falls into this battle of space. And the question is, is that harmful? Why is that, when is that accurate and when is that actually destructive of a fuller understanding of the issues? And I think that to the degree it rests on the personal characteristics of the combatants and on micro, that was a good. That was a good point. That was a telling blow. That kind of analysis, I think, it is indeed a problem. When it takes the step back and says, "Well, what have we learned? What did we know before? What do we now know? And to what degree has this face-off served the cause of public illumination?" I think that's good. So I'm not prepared to deny the inherent drama of these events. Because I think having people pay attention to those events is a good thing. And I think, and, and, and making them dramatic it, it will enhance the audience appeal. So to some degree, the story form is something that's good because it gets people interested in realities outside themselves, it gets them part of the community and this and that. So I guess at the point at which it eclipses the underlying issues, it eclipses the question of structural justice or, or uh, the deterioration in uh, behavior of the White House. It eclipses those questions, and I think uh, that's a problem. To the degree it advances or illuminates those questions, I think it's good. Okay, I think it's time for the lunch break. Mm -hmm.